Wizards of the Coast recently hosted a Strixhaven Symposium with awesome guests representing faculty from the five colleges of the Magic University. Frank Karsten and I were invited to represent Quandrix College, which specializes in the application of math to magic and in the study of mana in all its varieties and expressions. The lectures occurred on the main MTG Twitch site, but Wizards has kindly allowed me to reprise my lecture here. Welcome to Cultic Cube, where we cube religiously. We make you better at cube and make your cube better. Here at Strixhaven, we train aspiring young mages in the use of magic, fashioning powerful fractal energy beings, summoning tempests, growing a mouse into a monster, and bending the mind of the weak. You are here to learn of such spells, and so you shall. But before you arrive at the effect, you must investigate the cause. Magic is an art of managing resources, among which are mana, cards, time, and life. Here, in the Department of Manomancy and Applied Energetics in Quandrix College, we believe that mana is the most fundamental magic resource. Today we explain the origins of mana, both as an energy and as an idea, and then we tackle how to get the most out of our mana to bend it to our will. The first part of this talk briefly addresses how magic is explained in the lore of the game. We then trace an intellectual history of mana, the story of how the concept arrives in our game. The second part of our talk establishes how fundamental mana is in terms of game design, and we consider how we can leverage this knowledge to our advantage when playing the game. This latter half of the talk is aimed at those who know the fundamentals of Magic the Gathering, but may not be entirely enfranchised players. Nonetheless, we are in the hallowed halls of Quandrix, so rest assured that we will be bringing mathematical perspective to our arguments, which will be of interest, I hope, to novice and experienced players alike. In the context of the proliferating universes of magic, mana is a renewable resource for the casting of spells and the payment of abilities. It is tied closely to land, and the development of mana, the ebb and flow of our access to it, sets the pace at which our experiments in magic progress. There are five colors of mana, white, blue, black, red, and green, as well as colorless mana. These colors and their combinations define the world in which we live and the arts which we practice. In our universe, most mana is generated naturally along ley lines. Ley lines are deep features of the earth, and like tectonic fault lines, they are energetic sites marked by eruptive potential. These pathways of power have existed since time immemorial. Every plane, Strixhaven, Dominaria, Innistrad, and so on, has ley lines. Planeswalkers and mages are attracted to ley lines, and those trained in esoteric arts can channel ley lines potential in intentional ways. Powerful monsters, such as dragons, are those great enemies the Eldrazi are attracted to ley lines. They connect nodes of power, they can coalesce into deities, like the gods on the plane of Amonkhet, and into energy creatures, such as Omnath on Zendikar. The term mana has a history that's tied to planet Earth. It originates in the cultures of Polynesia and Melanesia in the Pacific Ocean. The word originally meant, in the Proto-Polynesian language, a force of nature, such as a typhoon. As Pacific Islanders spread, the word increasingly meant a supernatural force, an authority that attaches to places, objects, and people. In Hawaii, for example, the crater rim of the volcano that forms the island of Maui is considered to be strongly invested with mana. Objects can have mana, especially tools, such as an especially effective fishing net. People, particularly great warriors and kings, are invested with enormous amounts of mana. Mana is subject to natural cycles of increase and decrease, and, importantly, it is communicable. So, why do we at Strixhaven use the term? It was chosen by our founder, that great archmage Richard Garfield, thanks to its literary pedigree, a pedigree which itself relies on a misunderstanding of the Pacific Islander traditions that we just described. In 1949, Harvard anthropologist William Howells published a volume intended for popular consumption with a deeply suspect title, The Heathens, 
primitive man and his religions. Howells understood the Polynesian notion of mana to be a quantifiable force, something analogous to electricity. He writes, with some condescension, that mana, quote, was not scientific, of course, but it was otherwise completely logical. Mana flowed continually, from heavenly things to earthbound things, just as though from a positive to a negative pole. It came to the people through the chiefs, and the chiefs kept it and conducted it to whatever function needed it, ceremony, war, or agriculture. It was not a privilege of the chief that he had so much mana. It was rather his function in the scheme of things to serve as reservoir and transmitter of it. Coincidentally, another religious tradition has a homophonic term. Mana, M-A-N-N-A. We spell it with two N's conventionally in English. This comes from the story of the Exodus in Jewish and Christian literature. The Lord freed the Israelites from bondage in Egypt, and the people wandered in the desert for 40 years before claiming the promised land of Canaan. God provided food to the Israelites as they wandered in the desert, and this miraculous food was called manna. It was collected every morning from the earth, and it was a perishable commodity that must not be stored lest it spoil. American science fiction author Larry Niven was inspired by Howell's imperfect understanding of Polynesian manna and by the Judeo-Christian divine resource. Larry Niven imagined a universe in which manna is an energy source that is quantifiable. Quanta of manna are stored in and may be extracted from the earth, and this resource is depleted through its youth. Niven registers the concerns founded by the energy crises of the 1970s, when so-called Western nations experienced petroleum shortages, elevated oil prices, and periodic gas rationing. Larry Niven outlined this universe in his 1976 novel, The Magic Goes Away, and then he returned to and expanded on it in a number of other subsequent novels and short stories. This brings us to our founder, Richard Garfield. Garfield loved Niven's work, and for the designer of magic, Niven's quantum theory of magic was a touchstone. Garfield said in an interview, quote, Niven's view of magic as very mechanistic following regular laws, was a fundamental inspiration for the game. Garfield paid homage to Niven by building him into the lore of the game. In the very first set, which we call Alpha, Garfield designed a card called Nevineral's Disc, which is an immensely destructive artifact that wipes out creatures, enchantments, and artifacts. Nevineral is Larry Niven, spelled backwards. And the disc is a reference to the Warlock's Wheel in one of Niven's stories. In this narrative, a mysterious character known only as the Warlock creates a magical spinning wheel that depletes the mana in the surrounding landscape, rendering it barren. And the Warlock thus demonstrates that mana is a finite resource. Nevinero was introduced into magic lore as the Lich King of the city of Urborg on the plain of Dominaria. He wrote The Necromancer's Handbook, the foundational text for the study of the magic of the dead, which is a specialty of our colleagues in the College of Witherbloom here at Strixhaven. So, having performed our intellectual archaeology of mana, let us turn now to practical mana for combat mages. I pause for a moment to mention that I have a Patreon that supports the work of this show. Patrons get all sorts of perks bonus material, and first looks at upcoming projects. I also have an affiliate relationship with TCG Player, Inked Gaming, and Amazon. Thank you for your support. As I intimated earlier, the basic resources of magic are mana, cards, time, and life. Mana interacts with most of these. Mana is supplied by cards, such as lands, and mana is required to cast cards, Mana spending power is tied to time, as measured in turns in-game. Access to mana typically increases over time, and its availability is refreshed each turn. Magic has the least direct relationship with life among these resources, but also life is, perhaps paradoxically, the least important resource. Life essentially only matters as a binary condition. You have more than zero life, or you do not. You are alive, or you are not. Beyond that, a measure of life tends to matter first in racing situations, 
when one compares who is killing whom faster, and second, when one conceptualizes life as another quantifiable resource, like mana, as a resource that can be traded for time or for spells. Aspiring mages often care too much about life total. Spells that simply gain life are typically not worth a card. Life gain has to be attached to other, more substantive effects, or to be part of a combo to be worthwhile. Thrag Tusk is a good investment of five mana, as it not only gains five life, but gives you two creatures with a combined eight power and six toughness. Archangel of Thune and Spike Feeder are a well-known combo. And in a deck that capitalizes on such a combo, life gain is a valuable strategy. In Alpha, Richard Garfield included the so-called boon cycle of five instants, each costing one colored mana pip, and each providing three units of some resource that is a signature of the color. Even the most novice magicians will have heard of many of these effects. Ancestral Recall is so broken that it numbers among the so-called Power Nine, and it is the only member of the cycle never to have been reprinted. Lightning Bolt is a multi-format staple. Giant Growth provides a definitional baseline for combat trick efficiency. Dark Ritual provides a one-shot mana boost and is useful in combo strategies, such as Storm and a cube that supports it. White, however, poor White, has Healing Salve, which is mostly a life gain spell that trades mana and a card for three life. Mark Rosewater, lead designer of Magic, writes on his blog, quote, we stopped making Healing Salve because the modal quality was confusing for less enfranchised players, and the damage prevention part was seldom used. It was also mega weak. Healing Salve is the only member of the Boon Cycle that has been supplanted by a strictly better card, Healing Grace, from the 2018 set Dominaria. So let us turn back to the resource that I argue is more important, and that is mana, and let us discuss how it sets the pace of the game and how it interacts with variants. In general, one hopes to be able to play a land each turn for the first several turns of the game, such that one's buying power for casting spells and activating abilities increases at a linear rate. Thus mana sets the pace of the game, and it provides boundaries for what is possible to do in a game. Mana cost is one of the most important levers that the grand architects of magic have at their disposal when designing cards. One can change the mana value, this is what used to be called the converted mana cost of a card to balance it, that is make it more or less expensive. But also, one can add mana pips. A card that costs green green is simply more difficult to cast than a card that costs one and a green. And the latter is hugely more difficult to cast than a card that costs two generic mana. But of course, there are no guarantees in our craft that our mana will develop unproblematically and optimally throughout any given game. Some game franchises that are similar to ours allocate the equivalent of one land to each player each turn automatically, thereby doing away entirely with notions of being mana hosed or mana flooded. Our mana economy introduces variance into the game system, making the game less chess-like, where in chess opponents begin in essentially identical situations with identical resources. This variance makes games play out very differently and variance means that less skilled players may find success, even against opponents who are much more skilled. Variance also gives more knowledgeable players opportunities to find edges by bending variance to their advantage, or by strategically reducing variance. There's an ancient axiom in magic that the player who spends more mana wins more often. This is an important notion. The player who spends more mana wins more often. This rule has been tested in a data-oriented way by Sirkovitz, who is a contributor to the 17 Lands project that compiles reams of data about retail booster drafts on Magic the Gathering Arena. Sirkovitz confirms the rule, demonstrating that spending mana correlates to higher win percentages in general. Moreover, when we go a step further and compare mana spent by each player in a match, we find that the player who spends more mana than their opponent is more likely to win. The win percentages can be surprising. For instance, if you have spent three mana more than your opponent by turn 10 of the game, you are nearly 9% favored to win the game. If on turn three, you have spent just one more mana than your opponent, you are 4% favored to win the game. 
Mana and its maintenance is thus seminally important, and a number of things follow from our axiom. It is important to have a mana curve in one's deck. By this I mean that decks typically want a range of spells that cost different amounts. Cheaper spells should be privileged, and more expensive spells should be run in moderation. You want to have inexpensive spells in your opening hand, and you want to have spells to cast at every point in the game. It's important to have the appropriate number of lands in a deck. A general rule of thumb is that about 40% of one's deck should be comprised of lands. In limited decks, which run 40 rather than 60 cards, we tend to hedge a bit more conservatively and propose 17 lands as a good starting point. 17 lands is a guide, not a rule. It is important to recognize that deck goals affect the number of lands that one wants. I hope you attended my colleague Professor Frank Karsten's class for our Quandrix College at the Strixhaven Symposium, where he went into this idea in much more granular detail, using tools such as hypergeometric probability to help us make informed decisions about how much risk we are willing to take on when building our curve and our mana base. Low curve, aggressive decks can shave lands aggressively. When a cube of my design was on MTGO, Star City Games columnist Ryan Sachs wrote an article in which he argued that lean, mono-red, and mono-white decks in the format could cap their mana curve at spells that cost 3 mana value, and trim land count to 13, or even 12. It is unlikely that such liberal cutting of land is viable and retail limited. Don't do this in Strixhaven Draft. But Cube can allow for this variety of deck building. In the deck Sachs describes, running 17 lands would almost certainly be a mistake. Conversely, even in Retail Limited, there are higher curve and more controlling decks that prefer to run 18 or 19 mana sources. This is even more likely to be true in Retail Sealed, where one often dips into three or more colors, and one's deck strategy tends to be less tuned than in Draft. Mana efficiency is important. A good rule of thumb is that all things being equal, you should make plays that spend as much mana as possible each turn cycle. If you have 4 mana available, and you have a 3 mana value play, and 2 2 mana value plays in hand, you should err on the side of playing the 2 2 mana value spells. Mana whose possibility of being spent has been foreclosed is called stranded mana. Unused mana's purchasing power cannot be recuperated after the turn cycle ends and one untaps. Thus, stranded mana contributes inefficiency and waste to one's development. Of course, there are many reasons indeed why it is strategically defensible, or indeed imperative, to spend mana inefficiently. Mana sinks are spells, usually permanents, that offer ways of capitalizing on excess mana, typically in repeatable ways. These are especially useful in games of retail limited, where deck strategies are mostly shades of midrange, and games can stall more readily than in other formats. When looking for mana sinks, we want good effects, not cards that let us spend mana for the sake of spending mana. Mana sinks should be useful in late game, when we are most likely to have mana to spare. Sensei's Divining Top is a classic example, in the cube context, of a poor mana sink. This card doesn't do a great deal, unless one has a real density of shuffle effects to capitalize on it. By contrast, Retrofitter Foundry, another one-mana artifact, is a card that has quickly made a name for itself in cube environments, and this card is a fine mana sink that does an awful lot at any point in the game. The next thing that follows from our axiom is that playing first is better, on average, than drawing. There have been a number of studies of this phenomenon over time, but to take a couple of examples, a survey of over half a million games on MTGA in 2019 found that in Limited, the player who was on the play was 1% favored to win. In Constructed, the advantage typically increases, as here, where the person on the play in a game of Standard was more than 5% favored. A 2020 study of best of three draft data from MTGA found a 2% advantage to the player who was on the play. These numbers may not sound huge, but as numeromancers, we look to capitalize on every advantage. Magic Pro and Hall of Famer Reed Duke writes that while he can conceive of situations when it is better to choose to draw in limited magic, he has almost never chosen to do so in constructive. Playing first tends to be better because it allows one to start developing first, to put the first resources on the board, and to begin crafting one's game plan proactively before the opponent.
Assuming that both players have a land to play every turn, the person playing first likely has access to more cumulative mana potential than the person on the draw. Having the initiative and having more mana early tends to outweigh the consolation prize of an eighth card that is granted to the player on the draw. Another conundrum faced by players before a single card has been played is how aggressively to mulligan their starting hand, especially when the hand's mana availability or its curve look less than ideal. Mulliganing does have a sizable impact on expected win rate, although changes in mulligan rules have reduced that impact somewhat. A 2019 study by R. Conroy of MTGA Draft Data found that when the so-called Vancouver mulliganing rule was in place, mulliganing just one time cost players an average of almost 16 percentage points to win. After the Vancouver mulligan was jettisoned in favor of the London method, a mull to six costs one an average of 12 percentage points of expected win rate. A double-digit hit to win rate is a huge amount. But notice that mulliganing is 25% less punishing than it was in the past. And if one's hand doesn't give one a good chance to play magic, one simply can't win at magic. Now, I'm not trying to advise you whether you should mulligan more hands or fewer, but to give you the tools to make better informed decisions about the risks and rewards implicit in mulliganing. As we sit down to the draft table or to design our decks, we should already be thinking about our mana base or how our decisions will affect our access to mana. At the draft table, the less color committal your early picks, the better. A good colorless card is ideal, as it will allow you to move in any direction. Furthermore, if you know that you wish to end up in a color pair that shares a color, good cards of the shared color can be treated as effectively colorless and moved up the pick order. Let's say you are drafting retail Strixhaven, and you know that you have a strong preference for Quandrix, because of course, and for Prismari. Quandrix is green-blue, and Prismari is blue-red. Taking blue cards early is a good hedge that will allow you to move toward whichever college is more open. Be wary of picking multicolored cards early, as gold cards shepherd you toward a narrow lane, which may be disastrous if others share that path. In a cube draft context, there is an extraordinarily short list of gold cards that are in the pack one, pick one conversation for me. The list runs something like Limb Duel's Vault, Fractured Identity, Oko Thief of Crowns, and Deck Faden, but only in a cube with Boxen. In both limited and constructed magic, the more aggressive your strategy, the more closely you should cleave to one color. In a mono red deck, mountains cast all of your spells. If you have a light splash of white, a few planes are not extremely likely to hinder your early development though they might well interfere with your ability to cast multiple red spells in a turn, or to cast cards with multiple red pips in their casting cost. If your mana base is split evenly between red and white, you risk finding yourself unable to curve out in the first turns of the game, which is fatal to an aggressive strategy. Also, as aggressive decks often trim lands, they will find it still more difficult to find all their colors reliably. Controlling decks often want to err on the side of more mana sources as they aim to cast big, high-impact spells. They also may rely on mid-curve effects such as sweepers that may cost 4 or 5 mana, and these decks badly wish to find adequate mana sources to cast these on time. But there's a countervailing tendency as well. Xerox theory developed by Alan Comer in 1997 is a notion that relies on cantrips. Cantrips are cards that replace themselves, that draw a card, this theory leverages inexpensive cantrips to increase spell density in a deck and to shave lands at the rate of a land for every two or three cheap cantrips. Early in the game, cantrips can be traded towards land, whereas later they look for more relevant spells. We've been talking mainly about mana as produced by land, but there are, of course, non-land permanents that generate renewable mana. Here I survey a few that are relevant to the cube context. This is a very rough guide to how I think about uh, mana equivalency, but these numbers are context dependent, of course. What I do want to stress is that I would not count mana rocks that are three or more mana value and cost as a mana source. I wouldn't replace a land with one of these things. They're simply too expensive. You already need to have gotten to three mana in order to cast this thing and then make use of it. So I wouldn't rely on this to get you to that three mana in the first instance. 
My final point is that good mana is extremely important. I have a YouTube series on cube draft strategy wherein I propose the acronym FOCUS as a mnemonic approach to drafting. The F of FOCUS stands for fixing. Color fixing lands are excellent early picks as they allow your options and deck building to proliferate, whereas picking gold cards early forecloses possibilities by narrowing your lane. Fixing lands allow you to cast your spells, which means you are less likely to be frustrated by being color hosed. You are more likely to be able to play more magic. Your win percentage goes up when good lands make it increasingly likely that you can play your cards, and thus achieve our maxim that spending mana leads to success. Rainbow lands, such as City of Brass, are excellent. Fetch lands are extraordinarily desirable. If you take a flooded strand, but you end up in blue-red instead of white-blue, your strand will nevertheless allow you to find on-color duels, such as Volcanic Island and Steam Vents, as well as Basic Islands. Recall as well that a typical draft yields a pool of 45 cards, and we often play 23 or so spells in the main deck, assuming a 40-card deck with 17 lands. 23 cards is just half of our pool. Drafting and playing lands is a way of making more of your picks count. It gives you more cards that are contributing to your deck. Unlock more potential in your pool. I hope I have underscored the seminal importance of getting the most fundamental aspect of the game right in order to win more. Land counts may not sound especially exciting at first, but understanding them, making canny calculations about the risk that you shoulder by virtue of your mana base, will help you win more games of magic and give you the satisfaction of a deeper understanding of the mechanical laws that underpin our game. Thank you all for visiting Quandrix College. May your islands always be tropical and never, ever basic. <laughs>